On the 19th of February 2008, nine-year-old Shannon Matthews was reported missing in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire, after seemingly vanishing from outside the school gates. The following police inquiry proved to be one of the largest and the most expensive investigations Yorkshire had ever seen, only to find that the perpetrator was closer to home than anyone ever imagined. This is the shocking case of Shannon Matthews. Hi guys, thanks for joining me today. Today's case is one that I've covered on a couple of television documentaries, but obviously when I'm on TV, I don't get to say anywhere near as much as I want to. And also, I don't get to be as critical as I would like to because the mainstream media don't necessarily like people swearing on screen. Apparently, that's not appropriate with Ofcom rules and guidance, which is why I've got a YouTube channel can say it how I want to say it. Also, before I start, I am wearing my true crime queen top. I'm not saying I'm the only true crime queen. I know there's a lot of you true crime queens out there, but there is a link in the actual description below if you want to get through to my website and purchase one of these. There will be a Crime King one as well. So today's case is one that will leave those of you who don't know about it shocked. We'll reinforce the feelings that those of you who know about this case, and hopefully if you've seen other people cover it, I am going to cover it slightly differently and you'll still go home with some added value, shall we say. So let's talk about this case because there is a lot to unpack. Let's talk about the most important person in this, which is Shannon, so the little girl in this case. Shannon Louise Matthews is born on the 9th of September 1998. She was just nine years of age when she was actually abducted, when she disappeared. And I think we can all remember what it was like to be a nine-year-old child. You have a sense of security and foundation within where you live, even if that's dysfunctional, even if that isn't the safest environment for onlookers to explore. For you, it's home. And at nine years of age, your stability is provided for you by your primary caregivers, no matter how rubbish they are. And that means that anything that interjects and takes you from that situation is going to feel very, very scary. So like I said, no matter how inhospitable Shannon's life might be at nine years of age, her home will be her safety. She lived on a council estate called Moorside in Dewsbury, which is in West Yorkshire. I know Moorside. And it is an area that is very run down. It's economically very challenged. It is a place where there is a great amount of dysfunction, that it's also an incredibly close community. It does have huge problems, but it also has a huge heart. And I think that when we don't talk about one without the other, we fail to be honest about these environments. The descriptions of this area in the press by particular journalists when this case came to a close was, that I feel, tantamount to appalling. You cannot just slate an area because there's a high level of unemployment, there's a high level of poverty, there is social dysfunction because you negate the fact that there are many, many, many brilliant human beings there, many of whom got involved in trying to search for this little girl. So to acknowledge that Moorside in Dewsbury is run down and poor, but it's also full of people with great heart. Now, Shannon lived with her mother, Karen Matthews, and her mum's boyfriend, Craig Meehan. Craig Meehan was a local fishmonger. He was 10 years younger than Karen Matthews, so he was 22, Karen was 32. Shannon's dad, a guy called Leon Rose, he was pretty much out of the picture, I would say, at this point, so wasn't a big focus in Shannon's life. And Shannon lived with four of her seven siblings, so a big family. In total, five of Karen's children had different fathers. And that sounds like a judgment call. I'm not trying to come across as someone who's judgy and saying that it's wrong to have lots of children with lots of different men. I'm saying that it means there is a lack of stability in the home for those children. You cannot entertain lots of different relationships and have children in those relationships without the impacting on the children. So to this degree, we're gonna note that the living conditions that Karen will provide for her children was relatively dysfunctional. 
As I said, Moorside did have a very high crime rate. It had very high levels of unemployment. So there are social issues going on in the area. Now, who was Shannon Matthews? Well, first of all, she was considered a really shy and relatively withdrawn child. She had very few friends, which is really challenging when you're a child. We all want to feel popular. We all at least want to feel like we belong. And if you maybe don't have the most secure environment at home, you want school to provide you with a safe place. And she didn't get that. She got bullied at school. In fact, when she was free and she had free time to spend on play, it tended to be mostly in her bedroom playing computer games. So she's a really withdrawn and isolated kid. And that's in spite of the fact that she's got a lot of siblings. And I'm gonna say some things that won't be out there today. And they are only what I have gestated in my thoughts. I'm not saying that what I say is actually true. I'm saying that from my psychological experience and my therapeutic privilege of working with children for many years, I have garnered a certain understanding about the realities of children within their character, personality and actions. And so through that, I'm gonna give you some feelings that I had when I did this case in the press, but also in how I consider her personality and the way that she acts within that personality in her home and in her free time and in her school life and how things can be going on in the background that make that child withdraw. And I worry that things were happening to Shannon behind closed doors. I'm worried that one of the reasons she was so withdrawn is there is a level of abuse that's occurring in her life. She has siblings, there are people that she could spend time with, but actually she chooses to spend quite a lot of time on her own. And what we see with children who are abused is they do feel very depressed, they do feel very different, they do feel very isolated. And I think this would genuinely compute in this scenario that I'm gonna to describe today. So her disappearance, when does it all begin? When does it blow up essentially in the press onwards? So she disappears on the 19th of February, 2008. She disappears, they believe, around 3, 10 p.m. And that's because she leaves school. She's been at school all day. So therefore, that's the time that the school closes. Essentially, no one sees her after that point. So she basically vanishes from outside her school, Westmore Junior School, which is in Dewsbury Moor. And just after a visit to the Dewsbury Sports Centre for a swimming lesson, this is essentially where they've been until the close of school. So that's around half a mile from her home. Now bear in mind at the time of year that she disappeared, the weather conditions were really bad. It was really awful freezing temperatures, really heavy wind and really heavy rain. So totally awful if you're a little girl lost or you're wandering around by yourself and you don't have an adult to protect you in this situation, the elements are alone gonna be problematic. So the alarm essentially isn't rung until 6.48 p.m. This is when Karen Matthews speaks to the police to report her daughter missing. This is when she hasn't returned home and apparently she's knocked on doors. She's spoken to relatives and friends. She's been spoken to the school about it and absolutely no one can come up with seeing Shannon or actually knowing where she is after she's essentially left school. And I would say that when Karen is on the phone to the police, she doesn't sound hysterical. Some people would say, well, an individual's temperament is such that psychologically they'll just think of the best and they'll hope that they're reporting to the police and really exaggerating the need because they don't really need to find the child. It's probably going to be fine. And so they're not necessarily anything but calm, whereas somebody like myself would be hysterical. And I think a lot of us out there, if we were genuinely thinking our nine-year-old child, which is a dot, they're only very small at nine, had literally disappeared from the face of the earth and no one knew where they was, I don't think I'd be able to get the words out. I would need somebody else to report for me because one, I'd be running hysterically through the streets, screaming at their name. But some people can be calm in a crisis. Police emergency. Hey, I'm at the front door. It's missing, please. Right, how old is she? Nine. Nine? Yeah. When did you last see her? She went to school this morning. Right, have there been any arguments or no, not at all? No. Have, have you been in touch with any of her friends or anybody like that? Everywhere I can think of her friends, wives and family and everything. And nobody at all? No. Any information on where she can be? No. Does she go to school and come back on her own normally then? Yes. 
Right. So you were expecting her home off at four o'clock. That about half a seat where she's crying. I'm sure she's still at three. Does she have a mobile phone or anything like that? No, she's at home. Just right. So she, there's no way of actually ringing to find yeah. out. But you've run round all the friends. Yeah. And you've been in touch with all the relatives. Yeah. And there's nowhere else that you've got left to look. No. Have you been in touch with the school? Or, 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 or can they confirm whether she went to a normal time at ten past three? Right. What the caller? Shannon Matthews. Has she been missing before? No, third time. And there's been nothing to, to, to intimate why she should go? No, no. The investigation really begins on the 20th of February. So this is when West Yorkshire police escalate Shannon's disappearance of the homicide and major inquiry team. When it gets escalated to that, it's because they genuinely feel there's a strong possibility a child may have been murdered, definitely abducted or has come to serious harm. So it's disturbing when it's escalated to that level. It's contextual. It's what we'd expect protocol orientated. But if you're a parent and you know that they're literally referring you to the homicide and major inquiry team, you can understand that most parents would just disintegrate. And I would say that's one of the things that isn't going to play out where Karen Matthews is concerned. I would say that one of the things about Karen Matthews is she holds it together pretty well from the get go and all the way through. So it's at this point, Karen Matthews and Julie Bushby, who's one of her neighbors, they organize a search party. This is on the evening of the 20th of February to search for Shannon. And as I said, as much as this estate is going to get slated by lots of journalists, the whole estate gets involved with the search for that little girl. This is a very connected community who cannot believe that one of their own, a little girl, is missing and they all come together. And they come together constantly on this issue because they want to bring Shannon home. And also, they want to absolutely know that if somebody is out there with the potential to abduct and harm children, then damn straight, they want to be aware of who that is and find out who that is very quickly. There's a lot of children on that estate. But Julie Bushby is really involved, really engaged. She wants to do everything she can within this investigation to bring that little girl home. Now we get to the 21st of February. This is when Karen makes her first televised appeal for Shannon's safe return. Of course she does. And we know why press conferences occur. There are those that are authentically created because the police are 100% convinced that the people closest to the person who's gone missing is absolutely innocent. There is no issue about that. And they're doing it to provoke a reaction from the public, to actually get them to think about what's happened in their lives recently, to shake the memory should they have been involved in a scenario where they've seen something and forgotten about it and they want to also provoke a reality for the person who may have taken somebody maybe apply to their humanness and say please let this person go and so on and so forth but there are also people that the police are suspicious of and they put them in front of the cameras because they want to see what are they acting like how are they coming across psychologists will be analyzing it behavioral experts will be analyzing it and they will ask certain questions and watch the responses because even though you can't stereotype that every human being is going to act in the way that they are going to act because everybody's subjective and individual, you can expect a certain degree of emotion. You can expect certain body language. It's not a pure science. Even if people are out there saying it is, it isn't a pure science. I mean, culture changes the way that somebody acts on a behavioral level and a whole heap of other things. But there are certain expectations that you can have body language wise. And they're going to do that because it will help them figure out, yeah, we should be suspicious of this individual or these individuals. And then finally, they've got the McPhilpots of this world, a person who was responsible for burning to death his children, and they put him in front of the cameras because they damn right knew that he was guilty. They just wanted to give themselves some more loaded ammunition against a clear psychopathic killer. So personally, I would say from the get-go, the police are very suspicious of Karen Matthews and the story that she's telling and putting her in front of the cameras is probably just going to further that suspicion. It's at this point that police also receive a search warrant that means that they can search Shannon's house. And this is to obviously look around, see whether there's any indicators like a diary that's written saying that she's not happy, etc., and also to gather forensic evidence such as fingerprints. So that's what they do in search of her bedroom to get that data so that they can obviously go about finding Shannon. 
Now, this was a huge scale operation. It really, really was. So more than 250 officers and 60 detectives, that's around 10% of West Yorkshire's police operational strength were involved. So that's a huge surge. It actually became the largest police investigation in West Yorkshire since the Yorkshire Ripper 30 years earlier. And let me tell you, that's no small feat. When they were investigating the Yorkshire Ripper, a serial killer from the UK, they had so much information that the ceiling collapsed under it. So when you're coming next to that kind of investigation, that is next level investigating end of. They questioned 1,500 motorists. They searched 3,000 houses. And of 22 specialist victim recovery dogs in the UK, 18 were involved in this search. So they literally took all the resources and plowed it in to this area. And also remember the whole area, the whole community is involved in trying to find Shannon. Police even asked nine-year-old Megan Aldridge to help with the search for her best friend because Megan Aldridge was somebody who did spend time with Shannon and they wanted to try to engage with her to see whether she knew something that other people might not know because of the relationship that she had. Now, the police have got very few leads. They're desperate for evidence. So they essentially release the only material that they have. And it's CCTV footage of Shannon leaving school before she disappeared. Now, funnily enough, when Megan Aldridge, her best friend, saw this and she's the last person to see Shannon, it made her remember a really important detail. Because she said, there is something that stood out about this day. Nobody came to pick Shannon up. She suggested that usually somebody came to pick Shannon up. And so the last time she actually saw Shannon, she noticed that Shannon was walking alone in the opposite direction from her home. Now, at this point, her best friend said, listen, there is this foxhole that Shannon used to hide in to escape her bullies. So maybe she's gone there. And it breaks my heart saying that because how withdrawn, how lonely, how depressed must this child have been that she literally went and hid in a foxhole to escape her bullies. And how grotesque is it that children of nine years of age are being bullied to such a degree they have to take that kind of action? That's a blight on our humanity. It's a blight on the educational system. It's a blight on the staff who should have been able to protect her. And it's easy to be on the sidelines and say, well, you know, this stuff happens, but at the end of the day, people aren't always aware. Come on, if a child has got to the point where they're being bullied so badly, they're hiding in a foxhole and people know about this, everybody should be aware of it. And it should be that an intervention occurs. Poor Shannon. Her life must have been psychologically devastating in that situation. There's a huge amount of publicity around this case. So first of all, the West Yorkshire Police create a web page. It's called Missing Shannon Matthews Appeal. On the 7th of March, they go ahead and release a photograph of Shannon on the website. And they also release the 999 recording of the call made by Shannon's mother reporting her disappearance to the police. Now, first off, when you think about a child going missing, you hope to God they've just wandered off, gone to a friend's, ate too many biscuits and they're going to get into a serious amount of trouble for terrifying their parents when they are found. But for those who are missing for a period of time, more and more it becomes likely that that child is never going to come home and that is harrowing for anybody involved with a missing child case. Police always look at potential offenders. Who is in this area? Who could have placed this child at risk? So initially they look at the sex offenders register and they discover that there are 1400 people that is correct 1400 people within a 20 mile radius of Shannon's home who are sex offenders that's a huge amount of individuals who are deviant and dangerous towards children Julie Bushby the neighbor who's very actively involved in this said it was really scary because they suddenly could see that the people whose doors were being knocked on were clearly people who were paedophiles. They were the first people who were having questions asked by the police. And she could physically see the police going to those homes. She was astounded at how many paedophiles lived literally along the footpath that ran between the local infant and junior school. I kid you not. Let that sink in. 
So when we think about child sex offenders, we have an imagined perspective that they will be people that tabs are kept on. No, often doesn't happen. So we then think to ourselves, well, if tabs aren't necessarily being kept on them, surely what we're going to ensure is that they're not present close to children. You know, we're going to make sure that as far as we can see, they're not close to schools, they're not close to youth centres, they're not close to social buildings where children will go. Again, didn't get the memo, there's loads of them. And that means that when you put it into the context of those sex offenders, having children walking past their homes day in, day out. Now, I appreciate that not all paedophiles are abusive, aggressive sex offenders about to run out and grab a child off the street. Some can actually manage at times, I would say, when they're very low on the spectrum, to restrain and refrain from harming children. I think there's very few, but it does occasionally happen. But for the most part, if you are a paedophile who's actually offended, therefore you're a child molester, whether you've viewed content or whether you've physically abused a child physically, you don't need the temptation in front of you day in, day out, because that's how it is. It's a temptation. And the more somebody is tempted, the more they're desensitised to the consequences of their actions the more they're incentivized to act. And yet here we are with just loads of paedophiles along a footpath that runs between the local infant and junior school, the most vulnerable children in our community. It's disgraceful. And again, it speaks to a bigger, wider question, which is, are these individuals ever safe to be in our communities, let alone near our kids? Now, the investigators were using the Catchem database. Now, that Catchem database holds data relating to literally every child murder since 1960. And what that data tells us is that in child abductions by sex offenders, if a child isn't returned within 12 hours, there is a 97% chance that they are already dead. Within three days, that data rises to 100%. That is a horrifying statistic. It's a horrifying statistic for any parent who's ever had a child disappear because staggeringly, after three days, the perception is that they'll definitely be dead. Now, an exercise that the police asked the Matthews family to do was to create a family tree so they knew exactly who had contact with Shannon, who therefore might have access to her, and so on and so forth. And DC Nick Townsend, he actually said, well, we asked for a family tree, but it wasn't really a family tree. It was more of a family forest. So clearly there's a lot of family relatives involved, big families, shall we say. So Karen Matthews was part of a very large extended family. She was one of seven children and she also had seven children involved in different fathers. So you can imagine the spider web of connection there. Now, police identified 17 family members and close friends who were sex offenders. That literally happened. I mean... I do appreciate that child abuse is something that sadly is a relatively regular occurrence in our world, but to know 17 people who are sex offenders, that's pretty staggering and pretty scary and also means I doubt that you are keeping your children safe. I know that people will say, well, she may not have known. I think that's BS. I think that people like Karen Matthews are more than willing to invite very, very questionable people into their home. Now, obviously, Shannon has a father, Leon Rose. As I said, he's not living with Shannon at the time, but the police are going to look at him, obviously, because close connections are very regularly the people that they need to be suspicious of most. He was in his late 20s, early 30s when this played out. He and Karen Matthews had separated when Shannon was just two, and he was living in Huddersfield with his girlfriend at the time, a girl called Tracy Goldsman. They had two kids. Their relationship actually ended in 2008, but he now currently apparently works as a photographer. And Goldsmith said Leon literally thought the world of his daughter. So even though they may not have had a habitual relationship, as in seeing each other as regular as they would have liked to have, it turns out that as a dad, he was somebody who genuinely loved his child and obviously was also involved in the world of his other children. And he's eliminated pretty much immediately. He had an alibi. But there was a really upsetting and also equally beautiful note in Shannon's bedroom. And it was written on her wall and it said she wanted to live with her dad. 
Now, when a child writes something on the bedroom wall, it isn't just about a message to themselves saying, this is what I'd really like. It's a message to the other people around. It's basically her struggling and saying in frustration or anger or sadness, I want to be with my dad. And let me tell you, Shannon had very good insight and intuition because her father would definitely have been a far better choice than her mother. Now, none of you are going to be surprised that Craig Meehan is high on the suspects list from early on. He looks suspicious. Sorry, that's really judgy. It's also really true. You look at him and you're like, I'm suspicious of you. Everything about you seems weird and off. And I know that some people are awkward. I get it. But he's just like super awkward on steroids, stroke creepy. So they're looking at him. He didn't seem the brightest, shall we say. It's very reluctant to be interviewed by journalists, but then a lot of people don't want to be on TV. Equally, he does seem engaged in the search to some degree, but there is just something strange about this guy. And hold that in your mind for later on, because you genuinely will feel validated if you also believe that he's a bit of an oddball. Now, on the 9th of March, Karen's mum and dad actually gave an interview with a local tabloid accusing Craig Meehan of being violent towards Shannon. Now, you can understand, can't you? This is not what Karen Matthews wants to see. It's not what Craig Meehan wants to see. They want to be seen as victims. They don't want to be seen as people who've got a really unstable relationship where the male in the scenario is actually a perpetrator of violence. That's not going to look good on a PR level. And also, with respect, if we're dealing with an actual abduction of a child, the only thing that matters is Shannon. That's it. We should be concentrating all of our efforts, focusing on them. Tabloid papers should not be out trying to destroy the reputation of the parent and step parent in this situation. Now, don't get me wrong. What I'd say about Craig and Karen as human beings, they deserve everything they get, but not at this point. At this point, there is a child that is lost, abducted, dead. We don't know. But what we certainly don't need is the public losing their sense of empathy towards this couple because that's going to have a direct impact on the outcome for the child and shame on publications who think that that's the angle they should be looking at the only angle we should be concerned at is a child is missing now craig on the 10th of march he decides that he's going to give an interview again this is probably because he feels like he's got to go and deny things on record and he basically does that. He goes on television, says that all the allegations are lies and then says, I know a lot of people what can back that up. Yes, Craig, I'm just going to throw it out there. Going on television and saying, I didn't steal that money. And I know a lot of people who'd say I don't steal that money. Doesn't help because you might have shared all that money with those people. So you might know a lot of people what can back that up, but they might back you up because they like you. If the world was such that you could be like, no, I didn't murder that person. Are you sure you didn't murder that person? No, I didn't murder that person. We've got you on CCTV and we're pretty sure that you've got a weapon and you're chasing that person. No, I didn't do it. And you know why? I've got a lot of people what can back me up. Oh, who? My mum. Oh, just ask her then. Exactly. And I think you'll find that she will be somebody who what will back me up. Honestly, sorry, that's what he actually said. He said, what can back? that up. It's just, I really don't like it when people can't string a sentence together in a way that they should be able to in such circumstances. But you know, he doesn't realise that that isn't going to convince anybody. I know somebody who will say I didn't do it. It's not an alibi. Let me ask you directly, have you ever hurt a child? Would you ever consider hurting a child? No. Did, did you, were you ever cruel to her? No. There's even a lot of people that could back that up. There's a lot of my friends and family around here. So they even trust me with their kids. I look after my babes at the play, don't we? Same with our Courtney. I would never hurt anyone, basically. But, like I said, equally, I don't think anybody should be having these conversations right now in the press with the child missing. And then on the 12th of March, in a BBC Radio 4 interview, the parents are actually confronted with what they've said. And they said, we've never seen Craig beat Shannon with her own eyes, but the kids say it's happened. So they suggested that Craig is hitting Shannon. So it's reinforced again. 
And like I said, I'm not sure that BBC Radio 4 should be doing this at this moment in time. We should be concentrating on the child. Anything that takes the eye off the ball when it comes down to what could play out in finding this child is detrimental to the case. But again, Karen and Craig deny the allegations, say that he never touched her. But it's showing the destabilised position of this family. Obviously, they're not the closest because most of us would be supporting our nearest and dearest if a child was missing. We wouldn't be, shall we say, causing the more issues in the press. Karen Matthews then goes on another appeal on national TV, which makes sense because her little girl still hasn't been found. In this one, there is a stark change, really, in the way that she acts. So she looks very different in comparison to her previous TV interviews. She speaks quite carefully. She speaks quite deliberately. And she introduces this idea that someone that both she and Shannon knew could have abducted her. Also said that she can't trust people that are close to her, which she can't because the parents have been out saying that there are issues in her relationship. I would say what really comes out and across to me is... Jupiter's delight. She can't help herself. She's nervous, but she keeps smirking. It's not how you'd be. Bear in mind, a child has been missing for a period of time where the suspicion would be she'd be dead. And yet, she's doing what she's told. She's moving the toy to a particular position that she's brought with her. She's acknowledging people when they're questioning her and directly looking at them and kind of giving them a little smile. And the reason that she's doing that is she's got no emotional connection to this circumstance. She's not finding it funny, just her lack of emotional cogency in this situation that we would expect to see isn't present. So she's smirking because that's what people do when they're kind of a bit nervous. But also, she's not really got anything to be worried about. And we'll explore that a little further down the line. But in that moment, she's a bit childish, I would say. If you have lost a child and the suspicion now is that child will be dead, I don't even know how you would walk, let alone look relatively together and be able to listen to questions and answer them and to kind of give little smirks whilst doing it. Also, she's got this soft toy that she's brought with her. Didn't even belong to Shannon. So a neighbour of hers, a girl called Natalie Brown, she said one of the things that was really disconcerting for her was when she came downstairs clutching that teddy before the press conference, she asked her, is that Shannon's? And she said, I don't know. So it's all about creating an image it's not about my child's missing, I'm devastated, what can I do? It's about how do I portray myself in a way that people will think our loving parent, oh, I'll bring her favourite teddy, even though it's not really a teddy. And it's really odd to do that. The last thing you would do when your ultimately precious baby is missing is to just grab any toy because it shows indifference. Even though the world around you isn't going to see that, they're just going to think that is the teddy belonging to Shannon. As a human being, it shows indifference. And for those who knew her, they're going to be looking at that action and thinking, that is off. That isn't what we'd expect to see by a parent. Now, suspicions at this point are understandably growing because I'm just going to throw it out there. Karen is not necessarily the most sophisticated individual and she can't carry out a consistent behaviour. Like I said, lots of killers or lots of people who get involved in crimes people who break the law, they can act a certain way for a period of time, but you can't keep it up 100% of the time. If you're pretending you're sad when you're not sad, maybe you can do it 20% of the time. But the minute you close your doors, you're going to drop the act. And the problem is that people that you're used to and familiar with, they're going to see elements of that. There's an expectation that somebody who's dealing with something so absolutely enormous is a child abduction, stroke, potential homicide, is going to be inconsolable, probably drugged up because they just can't get through the day without a sedative and literally beside themselves. They're certainly not going to be doing some of the things that I'll talk about shortly. Now, Christine Bold starts to get really suspicious. She's a local community warden and she said that Karen had never basically liked her because she saw Christine as the local grass. And she's really concerned. Because even whilst this beautiful little girl is missing, Karen's house was just a party house. It was always a party house with respect. It was somewhere that everybody would go on the estate to have, shall we say, loud fun. But when Shannon's missing, they continue. That's absolutely bizarre. 
And we have this BBC journalist, a woman called Krista Ackroyd. She said it genuinely seemed like one of the things that was struggle for her was that Karen and Craig were relishing the spotlight. They were enjoying it. They liked people putting it at the centre of attention. They enjoyed being seen at leading marches and they enjoyed having their photographs taken, which you wouldn't feel like. And I've watched information and seen footage of them being photographed. This isn't stuff that's necessarily been on television or in the media, but I've seen clips of it. And genuinely, she's laughing. She's finding it funny. What a strange thing to do. Because even when you're trying to keep something up that might be fake, you would imagine that you'd be able to manage that for a very short period of time in front of journalists, but that's not how they are. And when the cameras weren't rolling, Karen and the family were laughing, they were making jokes, they were just getting on with their regular day whilst this beautiful little girl is missing. So anybody who's in close proximity with Karen Matthews and Craig, etc., they are recognising this is not normal. There is something very unusual about this setup and what's happening. Christine Freeman, that was a family liaison officer, they were really concerned with a lot of the inconsistencies as well in Karen's statement. So there were a lot of issues that were coming up that just didn't make sense. So first of all, Karen Matthews seemed really unconcerned about the progress of the investigation. Now, any parent who's lost a child is going to be diligently following it. You're going to be absolutely convinced that unless you stay on top of it with the police, something could go wrong and you want to bring your child home. But she just doesn't care. Also said that the family used to have this obsession with looking at live footage from the news teams about Shannon's disappearance. So they're constantly forensically following it. And then they just start laughing about it. And this family liaison officer actually spoke to the Telegraph in 2017, which is years after the event. But she said that she really felt something was odd from the get go. She was actually quoted as saying this. When I got to the house, Karen and her boyfriend were playing on an Xbox. Karen hardly looked up. After a few minutes, my phone rang. I had a pop song as my ringtone and Karen got up and started dancing to it. I remember thinking, this is really odd. And it is odd because throwing it out there, last thing most of us would be thinking about doing when our kid's missing, potentially dead, is having a bit of a bop to somebody's ringtone. Genuinely. Arrest her immediately. Throw away the key. Take said pop song and play it on loop for the next 66 years maybe 666 years, as you like, as you wish, guys. Now, Karen's interviewed by the police, of course, and she's taken to the police station to do that. And that is one of those scenarios that we'd expect to see when they've got suspicions. They don't want to feel too comfortable. If you're at home, you tend to be more comfortable than at the police station. So they're up in the ante on the way that they treat her. All she does is reiterate statements from the TV appeal. She goes on that she's convinced that Shannon's alive, that she's with someone else and that she just wants her to come home. And DCI Chris Walker actually said that all that did was make them even more suspicious of her. But obviously they didn't have the evidence at this point to link her to Shannon's disappearance. But ultimately, the fact that she refuses to acknowledge that her daughter could actually be dead, on one level people can look at it and say, well, that's because she's got hope. She doesn't want to believe that anything terrible has happened to her daughter. But if you're in a situation when a child's been gone for a period of time and you know that after three days a child is considered to be 100% dead, the last thing you're going to be doing to these trained officers is telling them what you think because the truth is they know what they're dealing with. And if she really had been abducted by a child sex offender, she's dead. So it would be false hope, but also it's misplaced because she will have had this information. The police will have been speaking to her about what they think probably is the likelihood outcome-wise of this case. And she's just refusing to accept it. And she's refusing to accept it because she's not emotionally linked to the idea that her daughter is dead, is she? She knows her daughter isn't dead. It's as simple as that. And then on the 13th of March... This is going to become very, very real for the police. All those suspicions, all those concerns are going to come to fruition because they get an anonymous tip asking if they've investigated a local man named Michael Donovan. Now, that anonymous call came from one of Michael's neighbours and this neighbour said, look, Michael usually comes over. He visits us every single day. But since Shannon's disappearance, we haven't heard from him. 
also they reported what they believed was a young child's footsteps that they could hear and they hadn't heard them before. So now we've got a child goes missing, a guy sounds like he's got a child in his house and he's also not going about his normal routine and habit. Then on the 14th of March, 2008, after 24 days missing, Shannon Matthews is found alive. And indeed, they search Michael Donovan's house in Batley Car, West Yorkshire, and they find her hidden in the base of a bed. And it's horrific. We're not talking about the fact that Shannon has been made to stay somewhere and has been kept in reasonable conditions. She'd been tethered to the bed. She'd been drugged with sedatives to keep her quiet. Can you imagine the horror that child would have endured? And I appreciate she was sedated heavily, so her memory will be blurred. But there is a primordial reality of trauma. It doesn't matter whether you are present within it or whether you are indeed drugged up to this degree, your body knows. So she may not have core memories that relate to this time, but her body will have core trauma without a doubt. And when they did further tests on this gorgeous little girl, they found out she'd been drugged up for two years prior to her disappearance. Now, some people could say dysfunctional family, drugging her to get her to sleep. Personally, I will stick with what I said earlier on. I believe that a child who is abused, often sexually, will be drugged. It makes them pliable. It makes it very difficult for them to remember. They often think they're in a sleep state and having nightmares and it's not real. I genuinely feel that child was probably placed into some very unsafe experiences, maybe with multiple people. I'm only saying what I feel. I'm not saying it's an absolute reality, but I do not under any circumstances understand how a child would have been drugged for any other reason for two years before her disappearance. Now, thankfully, one of the things that the family liaison officer also talked about was that Shannon was totally oblivious. She didn't know what was going on at the time, and that's clearly a good thing. Obviously, she'll have read about it as she's grown older. There's no way she'll have been safe from the reports that are out there. I imagine that there'll have been periods of her life where she will have read them again and again. And like I said, in spite of the fact that she may have gone on to leave a happy life and have a better experience and circumstance, those core memories will be in her body. You don't have to be conscious for core memories to become a real thing. And trauma is powerful. Now, when Shannon is found, obviously the police are like, brilliant. We've found your child, Karen. It's amazing. She's alive. That statistic, that 100% death rate, it's not true in this case. Even though she's been missing for over 20 days, we've actually got her. And this would, of course, be a period of elation because Karen is indeed going to get her gorgeous girl back. She's been wanting this, hasn't she? She's been telling everybody that she genuinely feels that she isn't dead. And now it's confirmed. So Karen's taken to the Jewishby police station to see Shannon it's behind a one-way mirror because they don't want Shannon to know that the mother's there. And this is to confirm that this is indeed Shannon, her daughter. Karen says it's her. Doesn't say anything else. Doesn't ask a question about Shannon's welfare. And DCI Chris Walker actually said Karen showed absolutely no emotion. Seemed detached, according to him. Let's just break that down, guys. Karen... You will be amazed. We found Shannon, right? Yeah, okay. You need to now identify that this is Shannon so that we can confirm indeed that this is the child that you've been going on about, you want back desperately, you love, that the home isn't the same without her, that your family's broken without her. Well, we need you to identify that this is indeed her so that you can be reassured that she's safe. Okay, I'll do that. Come into the room. I've come in, thanks. Take a look through that one-way mirror, okay? Is that Shannon? It is. Is that it? Well, it is, it's Shannon. Is that, is, that the, is, that the, is that the reaction for the second biggest investigation since the Yorkshire Ripper in the area? So I'm giving you. I'm just gonna put you through the door to the left. Oh yeah, what's through the left? It's a 50 foot drop. That's, that's what it is. So you can go and unemotionally relieve yourself from this life. 
Sorry. Again, too far, Emma? Too far, possibly. But immediately, the police are going to know, aren't they? They're going to instantly realise that Karen isn't acting in any way, shape or form like a mother who has just got her child back. And again, that still defies further the fact that they're dealing with a perpetrator of a crime, not a victim of a crime. Now, Shannon at this point is understandably not going home to the horrific human beings that wait for her there because it's a completely unsafe environment for her. So she's placed under police protection and then she's cared for by the social services department. And the police do this by exercising the powers under section 46 of the Children's Act 1989. And this allows a child to remain in police protection for 72 hours. And this little girl needs protecting above everything else. Now that protection it ended on the 17th of March. At this point, she's put into the care of Kirkley's family services. This is on a voluntary basis. Now, understandably, specially trained officers have to question Shannon because they need to figure out what on earth happened. And the questioning they did very tentatively. They understood that it was a child they were dealing with and they don't want to re-traumatise or traumatise further somebody who's been through a horrible ordeal. So it took several weeks. It took place in 10-minute sessions at a special children's suite, which resembled a classroom. It was very much about tentatively helping her to just figure out what on earth had gone on. Now, Donovan they find Shannon at his house. So clearly they arrest him at the scene. And at this point, they find out that Donovan was actually Paul Drake, who, well, unsurprisingly, one would say, happened to be the uncle of Craig Meehan, Shannon's stepdad. So curiouser and curiouser. Now, what I would say about this man is he did have learning difficulties. He had an IQ of around half the national average. So one could say more malleable, more susceptible, more easy to threaten. And maybe we have to believe that in the background within what was happening to him, there was a level of manipulation and that maybe he did go ahead and do things that he was told without necessarily thinking about the consequential realities of it. Now, Remember that family tree I talked about earlier on? You know, the one that was considered a family forest by one of the officers? This is what Karen Matthews had been asked to provide because they wanted to know about all the close connections. Yet somehow, Michael Donovan had been omitted from it. So she had purposefully and willfully not put his name on it. Mm, why? Why would you do that, Karen? Why would you avoid putting the name of the man who has been found with your daughter on the family tree? Hmm strange. And what Karen didn't know was at the same time that she's identifying Shannon, Donovan's actually being held in the Halifax police station. The first thing he said was, go and arrest Karen. I bet he did. I bet he did. Because the thing is, he's not thinking that he's going to get caught with his child and all of a sudden he's bound to rights. The kid's been found in his gaff and he doesn't want to take the fall alone. He says, get Karen down here. We'd got a plan we're sharing the money, 50,000 pounds. So this was obviously a reward if the information was brought that created the safe return of this child. Now, as soon as his interview actually began, he did actually refuse to talk, but instead his solicitor read out a three page statement and this accused Karen Matthews of forcing him to kidnap Shannon. He said, she said, if I told anyone or went to anyone, I would be dead. Now, CCTV that they dug up shows Donovan actually going shopping to buy Shannon new clothes. Apparently, he took her to the park three times when she was in prison, but it was only when it was dark and she had to have a hood up during that period of time. But I guess he's going to use that as an excuse to say, I wasn't her prisoner. I tried to give her a reasonable experience while she was at my home. Yet you tethered her. So you lose out on any of that. You literally drugged and tethered her. So I'm sorry. None of us are going to believe you. Anyway. In spite of the fact that he's vulnerable, in spite of the fact that his IQ is low, he's clearly somebody who knew what he was intending to do, which was to share the £50,000. So on the 17th of March 2008, he gets charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment. And on the 6th of April, he actually does try to take his own life. And I'm not surprised because what I would say about Donovan is he's not going to have an easy time whilst he's in prison. I think that prison is an incredibly challenging place for people who are involved in any kind of child crime. There is a real, shall we say, spectrum of acceptability when you are a prisoner. So if you are a gang member, if you are an individual who's carried out murders in scenarios where it's involved gang issues, 
you tend to have a really high status. Even big drug dealers will have a relatively high status. Then you've got individuals who people consider innocent. They tend to get left alone. And then it kind of goes down, 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 down to rapists of women, wife beaters, sex offenders, lowest of the low, and of course, child murderers being the absolute pièce de résistance as far as being dirt on the shoe of any prisoner. As somebody who has been recognised for taking a child, drugging a child, tethering a child to a bed, it's not going to be easy for you. And certainly it turns out he does not have a good experience in prison at all. And trying to take your own life, one, the shock of suddenly finding yourself inside. Secondly, the ramifications of realising what a serious offence you've been involved in. And as I said, the attitude of the prisoners around you is all going to collide. And certainly I think that's probably the main motivator for him trying to harm himself. Now, when it comes down to Karen Matthews and Craig Meehan, the police want to know whether they're all involved. And so they seize all the computers from the family home. And unsurprisingly, and I genuinely mean that from what I've said earlier on about the way Meehan is as a human being, he actually gets arrested on suspicion of possessing indecent images of children. They found 140 images. And again, that again speaks to me about why Shannon was drugged. I can't absolutely state it's a reality. I'm just saying that men who have an attraction to children, and he clearly did, he had 140 images found. Well, being around children is gonna be very alluring to him. And it deeply disturbs me that Shannon was drugged and that people like him were in the home. So on the 3rd of April, he gets charged with 11 offenses of possessing indecent images of children. He of course pled not guilty because why, Craig? Why would you plead not guilty? Because I'm not guilty. They're on your phone. They're on your computer. But I'm not guilty. Who's guilty? I'm guilty. But I'm going to say I'm not guilty. But clearly you are guilty. I'm not guilty. They're on my phone. They're on my devices. I'm odd. People around me are deeply suspicious of me. There's people that we know in the local area who are also sex offenders, hang out with them and have parties with them. But I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. The magistrate's going to find you guilty. You're guilty. But even though... He is, in fact, convicted by Jewsbury Magistrate of all 11 counts because he actually chose to get tried by the magistrate rather than the jury. He only received 20 weeks imprisonment. Deeply disturbs me. Bearing in mind that he was found guilty of 11 counts relating to 49 images of level 1, 2, 3 and 4. Those images were found on his computer. There's no way it was anybody else's. And they are some of the most serious grades of child abuse. We're talking the worst of the worst. We're talking Ian Watkiss level. I've covered that case if you want to go and watch it. We're talking that level. Horrific. And yeah, he only gets 20 weeks. What does 20 weeks in prison do to somebody who has that kind of mindset, who likes to see children in intolerable agony, sexually violated in the most intolerable of ways? But he actually got released immediately, to be fair on the day that he was found guilty because he'd spent longer on remand than the length of his sentence. It's a pity that that length of remand wasn't 100 years, 150 years maybe. Now, the police couldn't prove if Craig was actually aware of Shannon's kidnapping or his uncle's involvement, which is disturbing because of course he would have known. Sorry, but it's true. I know that the police can't prove it, but clearly, this guy was happily involved in watching horrific abuse of children. He's obviously been party and privy to the fact that Shannon has been drugged in the household for up to two years before she's taken. We already have Karen's parents saying that he was a perpetrator of domestic violence, which I absolutely imagine he was. Are we to believe that he didn't know that Karen had orchestrated this abduction with a member of his own family? Ludicrous. But anyway, they can't prove it. They can, however, and very fortunately prove, Karen Matthews is involved. So she gets arrested on the 6th of April 2008 and she actually confessed to her friend Julie Bushby that she had planned Shannon's kidnapping. Also, at this point, Christine Freeman was also present, so they both heard this information. So at this point, she is arrested and she's taken to the police station. She is 
bang to rights. Now, obviously, Karen Matthews needs to think of a defence, doesn't she? She's like, OK, I've been caught, I'm banged to rise. How am I going to play this? What's going to seem like a reasonable explanation for these actions? Why would my child be found at Michael Donovan's house? Why would I have missed his name off the family tree? So she's kind of had a few moments. She's not the most sophisticated person, so this is how it goes. So, Karen, could you please tell us why your daughter, Shannon, was found at Michael Donovan's address. Yeah. Oh, please tell us. It was because I needed to break up with Craig Meehan. Okay, what relevance does moving Shannon to a different house have to you doing that? It doesn't make sense, does it? No. Um. Well, just let me think about this for a second. Well, this is why. So basically, I felt that Shannon needed to be put in a safe place with Michael Donovan and I felt that only when she was in a safe place could I actually break up with Craig. Are you saying that Craig was a danger to Shannon? No, I'm not. That's not necessarily what I was saying because I have denied that he's a perpetrator on any level in the press on a few occasions. I'm saying I needed some breathing space. OK, so let's run with this. Let's run with the fact that you decided that you needed Shannon to be placed in a safe place so you could then concentrate on ending your relationship with Craig Meehan. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Why? What do you mean? Why the abduction? I just needed people to understand that I needed to break up with Craig. Karen, can I just stop you there? Because you know the hole that you've dug, it's got so deep that I don't know who you are or where you are anymore. And I'm pretty convinced if you carry on, you're going to bury yourself so deep you'll never get out of it yourself. You know, at the end of the day, bizarre. I'm just going to pop my child into, I'm going to pop my child into safekeeping, just safekeeping, a bit like you would with a watch in a bank. I've got a very expensive watch. I want to put it in one of those safekeeping lockers. At the end of the day, you don't need to construct any kind of scenario where you're like, hi, please. Yeah, my watch. I've got this really expensive watch. It's been stolen. I don't know where it is. You know when it's actually in a safe because you know exactly where you put it. It's ludicrous. But once the detective has actually listened to this bizarre story, they ask her, look, was this part of an act to make it look like she was genuinely missing when you knew she actually wasn't missing? And Karen says, yes. So... Again, clearly demonstrating that the story was about abduction, not about safeguarding. And Karen apparently started to cry and said, people hate me for what I've done. I've disgraced the kids. Karen Matthews was absolutely correct on that point. I have to give it to her. The only bit of insight that she showed was in that statement. She became a pretty hated figure in British crime history. Now, the thinking behind what actually played out is that Karen and Donovan had plotted to release Shannon after a while, and then unbelievably discover, oh, what's this? What's this? Oh my goodness, what's happening here? I'm just wa I'm walking down this road, I'm walking down this road, and oh, there's Shannon. Hello, Shannon. Look, what a coincidence. It's your mother. And apparently, they would then, quote, go into the police station and claim the reward. Now, I'm not suggesting any of us watching this have a mindset of the Sherlock Holmes level that we would see in the movies, but I think every single one of us can imagine not exactly a foolproof plan there, is it? Karen, it's not exactly a foolproof plan. The idea that either you or a member of your family, even though it's your boyfriend's side's family, would be the ones who just magically discovered her. But not just that, as if it's not reward enough. As if it's not reward enough to find the child. I mean, you'd be like, oh my God. Even if you were Donovan and you're a close connection to the family, you'd be like, I'm like a hero. Because that's how you'd feel, isn't it? If you genuinely found a missing child, you'd be like, I'm a hero. I'm a hero. Guys, I'm a hero. Who's going to give me the badge? I, are they going to write like some kind of Marvel character about me? You are going to be lauded in the local area. The only kind of reward you're going to need are the positive strokes of validation that will last 50 years. You know, you'll be the person in the pub when you're and They'll be like, that kid there, that old geezer, they might look like 
just an average old geezer. But the truth is, they absolutely are a hero. Because 53 years ago, they found a child that was missing. You're not necessarily going to be like, uh, sorry, uh, I've got this child. I found her. I do know the family. Or indeed, I'm this child's mother. And uh, before I accept her back, I want the £50,000 reward. But apparently, that was their thinking. Because that's not suspicious at all. Can you imagine Karen Matthews just walking in the double doors of the police station over to the desk? Guys, you'll never believe this. I've only gone and got my daughter back. Look at her. Don't she look great? Where are those £50,000? By the way, I apologise. I know that's not actually a Jewsbury accent, but Jewsbury accent's more like that, isn't it? Anyway, forget it. I did my best, guys. Just trying to make it more real for you. But anyway, that was thinking that she could have just walked in. Oh, all of you lot, you're not going to believe it. I've only got to get my daughter back. I just want the £50,000 and I'll take her home and it'll all be great. Genuinely, that was the thinking. But anyway, this plot went horribly wrong, didn't it? Because no one's going to expect you to be claiming reward money for your own daughter. So on the 8th of April, she gets arrested and charged with child neglect and, of course, perverting the course of justice. And at a hearing on the 5th of September 2008, she actually gets charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment as well because they're linking her to Donovan and the mutual agreement between the two. The trial happens on Wednesday the 12th of November. Karen Matthews and Michael Donovan actually stood on trial together. They were tried at Leeds Crown Court. Didn't even look at each other. As we expect with Karen Matthews, didn't show any emotion throughout because Karen Matthews essentially at the time had the emotional compass of a rock. It's as simple as that. Donovan, he actually had his jaw held together with a metal plate after surgery because he'd had a beating in prison. Like I said, he had a very, very difficult time in prison. And I don't have a lot of sympathy or empathy with Donovan because obviously the only person that matters in this case is Shannon. She had a childhood blighted by this, and I imagine a lot of her life blighted by this to some degree. But I do think that Donovan was manipulated. I think he was the lesser person imparted to this crime, and the ramifications and consequences were severe for him. The very fact that he had this kind of a beating in prison demonstrates the kind of trajectory he was going to go on whilst inside. Now, the prosecution case was that Matthews and Donovan had staged the kidnapping to claim the reward money, both pleaded not guilty. Of course he did. I mean, neither of them seemed guilty. It, why would you feel guilty when clearly you weren't guilty? It's as simple as that. Aside from the fact, let's just be honest, Donovan, you were found with the child in the home, in a bed, with tethers, and she'd clearly been drugged. That's guilty. Secondly... Karen Matthews admitted to put you on the family tree because she was guilty and everything she's done in between was guilty. She even admitted that she knew where Shannon was. She's guilty, but they go, not guilty. I imagine that people who were defending them were like, oh my God, if that, can somebody get me a really strong coffee and some mic will leave a headache tablets? Has anybody got a sedative? Because you would know that what this means is that everything's going to be out there and they're going to get ripped apart because the prosecution would be like, I'm so excited about this case. Hey, uh, do, you want, do you want your notes on it? Do you need to say, no, 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 I don't need any notes. Do you not want some kind of points of law that you want to bring up? Just say, no, 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 just let me in. I'm not even qualified. I'm literally the person who was serving sandwiches last Wednesday but for a laugh willing to let me represent because there's no way these two are getting away with it. That's the kind of level that we'd be at. So let's talk about Michael Donovan's testimony. He basically says it was all Karen's fault because she asked him to quote look after her daughter for a few days and that in asking him to look after this daughter for a few days she threatened him with violence. <laughs> like honestly I kid you not. I kid you not. I despair. I despair at people like this. So, Karen had asked him, uh, Michael, yeah, 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 Karen, how's it going? Yeah, it's going all right. Um, got a few problems at home. Can you look after Shannon for a few days? Oh, honestly, it's, it's not convenient at the moment. I will beat you up if you don't look after her. Okay, I'll look after her. Like, that never happens for a start. Like, you know, you'd be like, yes or no. But arguably, the looking after was under duress. She was going to beat him up. Apparently... 
Karen Matthews was somebody who had the physical prowess to scare quite a large man. But anyway, he said, listen, I took that childcare on board. I cared for Shannon. I actually went out of my way. I went and bought food. I went and bought clothes regularly. Now, I'm not saying he didn't buy clothes for her. I'm not saying he didn't buy food for her. I'm saying she was a prisoner. It's not the same. You know, we clothe and we feed prisoners in prison. Shannon was not a prisoner. She was an abducted child. Doesn't matter who abducted her. It doesn't matter the arrangements behind it. She's an abducted child. But he basically thinks that by feeding her and giving her clothes to wear, that makes him not culpable for this crime. Now, this is actually contradicted by the physical evidence that's found at Donovan's flat. So the jury have shown pictures of this and images that clearly demonstrates he knew what he was doing. So there was a tether, a quote tether that came from the ceiling. So Donovan would tie that around Shannon. It was around her waist and basically restrained her. So whenever he left the house, the only way she could go anywhere was attached to that rope. And that meant she could go to the bathroom and she could go to the bed. We're talking about a nine year old child. We're talking about a nine year old child tied in that place so that she could only reach the bed or the bathroom. It's absolutely disgraceful. It's what people do with dogs. And this is a little girl. Also, he was making sure that people didn't know where she was. He hid her in the drawer underneath the bed. I don't know about you guys, but I have on occasion looked after my friend's children. You know, I'm one of those quite community-based individuals. If you need me to look after your kid, you don't need to threaten me with violence. However, if I say yes to looking after said child, I don't, come in, come in. Would you like a sandwich? Would you like to put on this new top? Oh, good. Just come with me now. Just get in there. Well, it's, it's, I don't want to get into that, that thing under the bed. Get in there. It's just what good human beings who are doing childcare do. Said no well-adjusted human being ever. But that's essentially his excuse in spite of the fact they've got this drawer underneath the bed that she's hidden away in, clearly indicating what had gone on. Also, police found a list of rules Shannon had to follow, including you must not go near the window or you must not make any noise or bang your feet. And it was signed IPU and that stood for I promise you. Apparently that was a threat that Karen used against Shannon. So I promise you. And then it would be dot, 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 which she wouldn't need any explanation for. I imagine Shannon knew what the dot, dot, dot would be, i.e. violence and punishment. But again, if you're caring for a child, they don't need to be tethered to a bed. They don't need a list of rules saying that they can't make any noise or go to the window. That is deeply suspicious when apparently it's just a child minding scenario. Now the prosecution, well obviously they were doing a bit of a dance in the court, weren't they? Because it was so obvious they were going to be completely ruining this defence. So they actually argued that the very fact that that note was there, it shows a very dominant personality. It shows that this man knew what he was doing and it demonstrates the duality of the crime, both with Karen and with Donovan. And they kept Shannon completely subdued, completely obedient because she's a good kid. And we have to remember that this child was not trying to escape. She was doing what she was told. Yes, she was drugged, that's horrific enough. But it just shows that she wasn't a child who was acting out and problematic. She was a child who was absolutely at others beck and call and doing whatever she needed to stay safe. Now, Craig Chatterton, who is a forensic toxicologist, he said that when he took hair samples from Shannon, that it showed she'd had regular doses of the potent hypnotic drug temazepam in the months before she disappeared. And traces were actually found in each segment of her hair that showed that they'd been ingested over an extended period dating back 20 months. That's horrific. They also found trace amount of the drug plus the travel sickness meds melcazine. They were found in Shannon's urine after she was found and they'd been ingested up to 72 hours before the sample was taken. So they were drugging this kid up for years, not for days. And what the hell was going on when she was sedated? What the hell was happening to that little girl? Now, when it came down to Karen Matthews' testimony, this happened on the 27th of November. And of course, she's like, I had nothing to do with it. That's what she said. I had nothing to do with it. Claimed that Craig Meehan told her to take the blame for what happened. And she said that she did that because she was scared of him. Were you scared of him? I was so scared of him. Why did you deny it in the press when everybody was saying that he was being violent towards Shannon? Why weren't you scared of him then? I forgot that I was scared of him then. I'm only scared of him now. Now that you know you've got all this evidence on me, now that it seems that I'm going to go to prison. Now I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm going to be very scared of him. You're lying. 
that's what's the reality here. Also, she said that on quite a few occasions, Craig had raped her. These claims have actually never been proven. But, you know, if there's a bus, throw him under it, throw him under it again and throw him under it again. Is there three buses coming that can run over Craig? I mean, I would not lose any sleep if there were because he's obviously a child sexual predator. So I'm not going to say that this couldn't have happened. Maybe he was violent. Maybe he was doing those things. What I'm saying is it can't be substantiated by evidence and proven in a court of law. Now, Julian Goose for the prosecution said that she had actually told police a total of five versions of the story. So said Karen Matthews fabricates everything everywhere about everybody. Accused her of telling lie after lie after lie, which is very easy to evidence. They also brought in evidence that Karen went shopping for a sat-nav on the night of Shannon's disappearance. Apparently she was unable to explain this. Can you explain why you went shopping for a sat-nav when you should have been roaming the streets terrified because your child had been potentially abducted or even worse? I can't explain this. Is it because you're a massive liar? Just going to throw that in there. I can't explain. You are a liar. That's what I'm going to explain. But this is again demonstrating that she's not at all fearful for her daughter missing. It's as simple as that. Then on the 4th of December 2008, we get to the verdict and you will be really surprised to know that Karen Matthews and Michael Donovan were found guilty of kidnapping, false imprisonment and of course perverting the course of justice. And Mr Justice McCombe stated, the offences you committed were truly despicable. It's impossible to conceive how you put this young girl through the ordeal that you inflicted on her. He said that he found Matthews and Donovan equally culpable, so didn't buy into the fact that she was more manipulative or he was more manipulative or one was more dominant than the other. The only victim in this case is Shannon Matthews and she 100% deserves every part of the sympathy and empathy that all of us would bestow on her and Matthews and Donovan deserve none of it. Now, the judge actually allowed the publication of an extract from a local social workers report that Shannon was disturbed, traumatised and frightened when she was taken into care after her release. The report said she appears to relive her experiences and often complains of having nightmares where she's tied up. It's what I said earlier on, as much as they said in those early days that she was not able to recount or recall what happened to her, her body remembers it becomes a core traumatic memory. You don't have to be completely conscious and present. We see that again and again in cases where children have been raped in their sleep and they've been drugged, etc. It's still where their body is affected and that impacts on the memories in the brain just in a slightly different way. It comes out in different contexts than it would do if you had that absolute sharp memory of it. And often it can be even more problematic because you don't have a core memory to contend with when you think about practices like EMDR therapy, even things like schema therapy where you can really desensitize some of those memories by having that sharp connection with it. When you don't, because it's been dulled by things like drugs and sleep, that can make it really, really complex. And when you think about CPTSD, that can also be something that's a ramification of this kind of behavior. We get to the sentencing that happens on the 23rd of December 2009 and they're sentenced to eight years in prison, which I think is really pathetic. Sorry. We're talking about a child being abducted, drugged, tethered. God knows what else happened to her. The idea that that's an eight year sentence for traumatizing a child with such gravity, for costing the taxpayer the amount of money when you think about the resources plugged into this particular case. When you think about the lies told, it's just bizarre that it was only eight years. And so that meant that Donovan spent four years in Wakefield Prison. So in March 2012, he got released. And then in April 2012, Karen Matthews was released because she served half a sentence. Matthews reportedly moved to the south of the country and became a born-again Christian. Yeah, giving her a new identity and she's a born-again Christian because obviously the big G.O.D. will forgive. I'm not sure that he will. To be honest, Karen, I'm just throwing it out there. Personally, I don't think the big G.O.D. thinks that four years is enough. But now she allegedly works in a Christian charity shop. So apparently she's made it OK with the big J.C. We'll see how that plays out in the future. Now, in a 2018 interview with The Mirror, one of the things that Karen Matthews stroke new identity actually said is that she's scared she'll die lonely and alone. And she insisted that she was innocent of plotting to kidnap her own daughter, despite having been found guilty. She said, I'm not Britain's worst mum. 
I didn't kill anybody. From the start, I didn't know where she was. Others were involved. I didn't have a clue. You can't kidnap your own child. Yes, you can. And you did. Now, the reason I'm also very suspicious about whether she really has found the big G-O-D is that, bear in mind, you can't bear false witness. It's one of the Ten Commandments, you know, you can't lie, basically. Now, in a 2018 interview with The Mirror, Karen Matthews, or whoever she is now, said that she was scared she'll die lonely and alone, and also insisted that she's innocent of plotting to kidnap her own daughter, despite having been found guilty. She said, I'm not Britain's worst mum. I didn't kill anybody. From the start, I didn't know where she was. Others were involved. I didn't have a clue. You can't, quote, kidnap your own child. Yes, you can. And you did. And you got found guilty of it because you literally admitted that you did know where she was all the time. The very fact that she pretends that she's a born-again Christian, even if she does work voluntarily in a Christian shop, probably because it's the only place that will have her, you don't get to say you have acknowledged your sins if you're going to carry on lying about them. So I don't believe her. She's a massive liar. Even at this point, she's not taking accountability and responsibility. She's saying, I'm not Britain's worst one. I didn't kill anybody. As if she's got this like spectrum of, how dare they call me Britain's worst? Can you believe it, Margaret? I'm just sorting out all of these clothes that have been brought into the charity. Can you believe it, Margaret? They're saying I'm Britain's worst mum. I will tell you I am not Britain's worst mum because I did not murder her. And I could be a worse mother if I had murdered her. Like, if that's your benchmark, did I kill my child? And that means that you feel okay with yourself. And you're like, I don't feel like it's appropriate for people to judge me this harshly. I could have killed her. That demonstrates you are Britain's worst mum or one of them. Because even in the light of being able to reflect on the horror of your crime, you still think, well, I could have been worse. I could have been worse, Margaret. I don't know why I brought Margaret into it. I don't know who she is, and I'm sure that she's lovely if she does work in a Christian shop. Anyway, you can kidnap your own child. You did, and you're definitely in the league of Britain's worst mum. Now, bear in mind, we've got the aftermath, haven't we? Because we've got Shannon and we've got her siblings, and they're what matter in all of this. Shannon Matthews got taken into care. She was rightfully given a new identity. She was rightfully given a new family. She's now 25 years of age, and there is actually a special order in place, which means that people can't just go and willy-nilly contact her from the press. But her grandparents, June and Gordon Matthews, said that they have seen a recent picture of their granddaughter, who they describe as beautiful. And I hope that her life has been beautiful. I hope that in the sliding doors horror of what she experienced, there has been light at the end of the tunnel. I hope that the people who took her in have loved her as she absolutely deserved to be loved. I hope she's been seen to be visible for all her best qualities. I hope that she's succeeded in her life. And I hope that she, as a human being, feels that traumatised as she may have been, it has led to certain positive outcomes. And all of Karen's other children were taken into care, all of them were given new identities and she has clearly never regained custody because she is not safe to be around children. I don't care how she says she's repented, she clearly hasn't enough, she clearly doesn't see herself as the guilty party. Now one of the things that this case brought a lot of attention to was the disparity, the difference between the publicity that was given to the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and the amount of publicity that was given to Shannon when she went missing. So Madeline McCann, very renowned case in the UK, she was a child who went missing nine months earlier in 2007. And to some degree, there are real similarities. So it involves defenseless young girls who just vanish without a trace. Both featured these televised appeals from apparently devastated mothers. I do believe that when it comes down to the McCann case, she was absolutely devastated. I know there's going to be people writing how they believe that Madeleine McCann's mother is guilty, etc. Believe me, I have gone through that case in minute detail. I haven't covered it on here because I'm not ready to, but she did not have anything to do with the disappearance of a child. So she is devastated. And I'm also going to have people saying she deserves what No one deserves what happens? If you take the eye off the ball, yes, you feel guilty for that. And yes, you should be judged for that taking the eye off the ball, but that's it. You're not responsible for some bastard 
taking your child and probably ultimately murdering your child. That's not your fault. That's the bastard's fault. But anyway, before anybody writes loads of comments, I will do that case, I promise you. I know it provokes a lot of reaction, but I'm telling you, she, Kate McCann, was genuinely horrified, devastated. Whereas Karen Matthews wasn't, because she knew that her daughter was absolutely fine. Not fine in our view, but fine in her view. Also, they both came on television with the clutching of the daughter's favourite toys, so Cuddle Cat, which was obviously Madeline's, whereas we know Karen Matthews was carrying a teddy that didn't even belong to her daughter. But there were similarities. Bear in mind, we know the outcome, so I'm talking about this reflectively. But, you know, in the actual eye of the storm, there were clear crossovers, but there was a major difference, and that was their social class. So just to put it into context, after 14 days, British journalists had penned 1,148 stories that were devoted to Madeleine McCann. The sum of 2.6 million had been offered as a reward for her safe return. There were prominent donors. This included the News of the World, the Sun newspapers, Sir Richard Branson, Simon Cowell, J.K. Rowling. Madeleine McCann quickly became, and still is, a household name. Absolutely, 100% still is a household name. And I fully believe should still be a household name. But in contrast, after two weeks, Shannon's case had received a third of the coverage devoted to Madeleine. There was no rolling news team in Dewsbury. There were no politicians wearing coloured ribbons. And the reward offered for Shannon's recovery was initially only £20,000. Now, the son, they increased it to 50000 on the 10th of March. She'd been missing at this point for 20 days. And a business in Huddersfield, which was nine miles from Dewsbury, offered £5,000. So if money was anything to go by, the life of Madeleine McCann had been deemed 50 times more valuable than that of Shannon Matthews. And the reason for this stark difference in the treatment between the two cases was put very succinctly by The Independent. It said, Kate and Jerry McCann had a lot. There were a couple of nice middle-class doctors on holiday in an upmarket resort. Karen Matthews is not as elegant nor as eloquent. Bear in mind, this is not diminishing Jerry and Kate and not diminishing all the work that they put into to keep Madeline in the press. I think that's a good thing. But Jerry and Kate were doctors. They lived in a middle class suburb of Leicestershire. They were really photogenic. They were well put together. If you were going to create this almost idealistic perspective and projection of what the perfect middle class family would look like, they'd embody it. Then you've got Karen Matthews and Craig Meehan. They're like the opposite, particularly in the way that they came across on TV. And one journalist actually explained the lack of media frenzy over Shannon. It said, it is up north. It's a bleak mix of pebbled ash council blocks and neglected wasteland, and it's populated by some people capable of confirming the worst stereotype and prejudice of the white underclass. So one was a reporting dream, one was potentially a reporting nightmare. One sold newspapers, one failed to. And because of that, the amount of black and white that was put out there was far smaller where Sharon and Matthews was concerned and yet she was an incalculably important human being who deserved a great deal of attention and I do note that there are cases across the board where children have not been given the publicity they should be given and absolutely deserve to be given in comparison to Madeleine McCann. That said I would never say that as a parent, I would not want my child to be the forefront in everybody's memories, no matter how many years have passed since my child's abduction. So I have sympathy and empathy on all levels. Now, once it became public knowledge that Karen Matthews had staged her daughter's kidnapping, bear in mind, media coverage got a thousand percent more prejudiced. So it's no longer about Karen as an individual, but it was about Karen's working class background. And Journalists like Carol Malone insisted that they knew exactly what a council estate was like because they lived next to one. No, I don't live on one. I live next to one. So I'm an expert. Wouldn't it be better to actually be somebody who lived on a council estate? No, I lived next to one in a really nice area and I didn't ever go to the council estate, but I've heard stories from it. So I'm definitely the kind of person who should be able to comment on this. And she did. She wrote that... Matthews, Meehan and Donovan belonged to that subhuman class that now exists in the murkiest, darkest corners of the country. 
They were good-for-nothing scroungers who have no morals, no compassion, no sense of responsibility, and who are incapable of feeling love or guilt. What? Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Owen Jones in the UK. I'm going to say that first of all, but I do agree with what he said. He said, imagine that she'd been talking about people who were black or Jewish or even Scottish. There would have been uproar, but there was no such response. And I agree. I worked on a council estate, one of the biggest in Europe for nearly a decade, working with young offenders. It was one of the most joyful times I had in my life. I remember it as summer. I still have contact with so many of the individuals that I had the pleasure and privilege of working with. And yeah, there were bad people. There are on my estate where I live. But let me tell you, to brush everybody that way when the significant majority are nothing like that was described and to imagine that we have a right to do so because we lived near a council estate is reprehensible. Life isn't fair. Some of us get born in the wrong postcode without the same privilege, without the great parents, without the opportunities that others are provided. And the idea that we start off far behind the starting blocks of others and then are judged throughout because of our address and because of actions of others in the areas that we live, it's ludicrous. And yet so often when it comes down to places of poverty and when it comes down to places which incur dysfunction, these kind of stereotypical responses are given. And another thing that Owen Jones actually suggested, I'm not getting political by the way, I'm just bringing in different perspectives. Owen Jones said that Karen Matthews became a convenient political prop, suggesting that the Tory party actually used the case to garner public support for their subsequent policy of austerity, i.e. that building lots of social housing was bad because it would just encourage this kind of person and cutting benefits is good because they need to work and so on and so forth. And actually what we know in the UK is austerity failed really badly. So I'm going to stop with that rant, but I do think the way that this case was covered demonstrates a real bias and prejudice towards a particular class in the UK. And I don't think that's how we tackle these kind of issues by just being highly judgmental. Although, I'm highly judgmental towards Karen Matthews every single day of the week. Now, there was a serious case review in this situation. And on the 16th of June 2010, a Kirkley Safeguarding Children's Board reported that social services could not have anticipated Shannon's abduction. That makes sense because at the end of the day, it's a big case. It's got loads of attention. There's been loads of reflective exercise on this. But how could they know that that plan was unfolding? And there were a lot of issues in that local area which maybe meant that they weren't directly looking at Shannon Matthews as a child who was at risk. It was only after the event they realised just how at risk she was. Now, this case received so much attention, so the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, all released documentaries on the case. I have been in documentaries on this case. And in August 2022, Shannon Matthews, the musical, premiered at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I'm not quite convinced that the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is an acceptable place for a story on Shannon Matthews, although art should provoke, so who am I to say? I just think that sometimes we have to remember that the person who matters here is Shannon Matthews, whoever she is these days, whatever she goes by, whatever she does. And though people want to know about this case and always will, we've got to draw lines of what's acceptable when covering it. This is a little girl who had her life changed in the most horrific of ways, and I hope in the positive way as well. But she's out there. I imagine she'll look at things like this from time to time, and I hope she knows that each and every one of us who spends time thinking about who she is and what she endured, that she understands how much we care about her story and how visible she is within it, even though we don't focus too much on what happened to her directly, because she is the victim in this case but it's the perpetrators that we want to bring into sharp focus. I really hope that Shannon Matthews, whoever she is these days, is living a great life. I hope she has a family. I hope she falls in love. I hope she has a job that she enjoys, a support network that she deserves. I hope that her life hasn't been blighted too badly by Craig Meehan and by Karen Matthews and by, of course, Donovan, the man who actually kept her a prisoner for that period of time. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. If you know this and I've told you some more, let me know. Or if you know more about this, please do get in contact. Like I said, I ain't buying into Karen Matthews becoming a born again Christian. I don't think for a minute that she stopped her lying ways. And because of that, 
I really do think she is one of Britain's worst mothers ever. Take care, guys. Let me know your thoughts, and I'll see you again next time.